your book, uh, let's not try to play games. It was written and it, you, you gave your summation of it in this little video you put out. The summation from my perspective is that this book was put out for the purpose of getting people to throw out their King James and get an NIV. Okay, um, lie number, what, what lie number are we on? Was that, that's four or five? Let's call it four just to be nice. Lie number four, um, that simply is not the case. Um, I wrote the book and I know why I wrote it. And you can misrepresent it all you want, but it's still a lie. Um, nowhere did I suggest anyone throw out the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, nowhere was, did I make the NIV the issue. Uh, if, if I was writing it today, the ESV would be where the NIV is in most places, but this was before the ESV. And uh, just simply as a, another popular uh, translation that was very popular at the time when I wrote the book in 1994. Uh, in fact, I think I, I think I did sneak the, a couple ESV variants in, in the second edition, if I recall correctly. Um, but not, not many, it wasn't, gonna, it wasn't supposed to be an entire revision. Uh, anyways, um, so the point again being he, the person who has uh, debated against people like Bart Ehrman and John Dominic Crossan and John Shelby Spong and Marcus Borg and, and these people who attack the, the text of scripture, um, he actually is a part of that attack because he's not on our side on this issue. So all the rest of that stuff just disappears. That's, that, that's how these people think. And, and people struggle with, with how to get through these folks. I, I don't know how to get through these folks. See, we have seen many people, many, many, many people uh, leave this movement, thankfully, um, and get involved with healthy, solid uh, churches that teach the whole counsel of God rather than just little part, parts and pieces of it. Uh, but there's no trick to this. Now, personally, I think many people in the IFB King James Only movement are, they are well aware of how shallow it is. They've, they've seen the backstabbing, they've seen the shallowness of it, they've seen um, how it's all bluster and it, and it has no depth to it. And yet they're afraid, they don't know what to do, where to go. And that's why over the past number of years, uh, Rachel will say, will mention uh, starting uh, at G3, again, it happened this year, lots of folks come up to you. And you know, this one guy came up to me and said, you know, I, I, was, I grew up being taught by my pastor to hate you. You were, you were the devil incarnate. Um, you, were, you were trying to destroy the King James Bible, God's inerrant word to mankind. And, and finally one day I was like, man, that, we talk so much about this guy. I, I got to see what he's like. And I started watching debates and you're defending the deity of Christ and the Trinity and and the gospel of grace, and, and you, you don't hate the King James Version of the Bible, and, and you start asking questions, and finally I came to realize the reason that we are attacking this man is because we don't have any answers to what he's saying. And that then led him out of that and into an understanding of the freedom of God's grace, and, and it's been a wonderful benefit in his life. And I'm very, very thankful for all of that. You can't stop any of that, sir, because you don't have the answer is to do so. All you can do is just keep repeating these straw men, misrepresentations. It's all you've got. It's just all you've got. And I feel for you. I, I hope that, that providing these responses, if we can debate, if we can get together, my hope is that you will see that you have been giving a partial story and that there is a real story. It's a, it's a much greater story. It's a much deeper story than the, uh, the version you have been, you have been putting out. Um, so yeah, uh, we continue on here. I believe you're a plant in the churches. And uh, <clears throat> I believe that uh, I should not debate you. Most likely I will not. So I'm a plant in the churches. And uh, so all that... <sighs> All those decades of uh, sermons where I'm dealing with nothing has anything to do with the King James only issue, but from their mind, everything has to do with the King James only issue. So I can be preaching on sola scriptura and justification by faith and the resurrection of Christ and the imputed righteousness of Christ and all sorts of stuff that no Roman Catholic would ever preach on. 
but it's all a plant because the big issue, the, the bigger than the gospel, bigger than all of that stuff, bigger than the Trinity or anything else, the big issue is the King James Version of the Bible, 17th century Anglican translation. That's, that's definitive of it all. You see how dangerous this is? You see how warping it is of the mindset? It's amazing. But I'm considering it under the correct parameters. Now, let me tell you what my biggest problem here is. I don't debate Catholics. And um, you are a staunch predestinarian. Okay, now, now catch that. I don't debate Catholics. Um, I'm glad, sir, because they would destroy you. They would eat your lunch. Uh, there are some good, solid Catholic debaters out there that <laughs> they would tie you in knots. I've seen it happen. So I, I would like to recommend to you, do not debate Catholics. It would be very embarrassing. I, when Ron Nemec and um, Brother Jackson uh, debated Keating and Madrid in Denver in 90... 93, yeah, well, we were there. Yeah, I was debating Jerry Manitix that night. Um, that was embarrassing. They, they, they were not prepared for that. They did not have the grounding to be able to do that. So uh, let me first of all say, I applaud you. Don't debate Catholics. You're not ready for it. They will absolutely run over you. Uh, so, so don't do that. Uh, but secondly, do not use the lame excuse that I'm a Catholic because everybody in the world knows that's all it is, is a lame excuse. If you can redefine what it means to be a Roman Catholic so that I'm a Catholic, then you can redefine anything. Words have no meaning to you. History has no meaning to you. Reality, logic, it's all, it's all just Plato to be used as you, as you see fit in your King James onlyism. Um, and then to say, I am a staunch predestinarian. If you mean I accept Ephesians 1, Romans 8 and 9, John chapter 6, John chapter 10, John chapter 17. If I, like Paul, endure all things for the sake of the elect, um, then um, yes, I am most definitely a staunch predestinarian. And I have met a very small handful, there are very few of them left, of Augustinian Roman Catholics who would be in some sense predestinarian. But to be Orthodox Roman Catholic and to be truly predestinarian in the sense of God has an elect people that he has freely chosen solely on the basis of his goodwill. Ephesians 1, 5 through 7. Um, that really violates the Council of Trent. And so you are taking two things that are actually contradictory to one another and you are connecting them together in your fevered thinking the fever of thinking being produced by the oddity of King James onlyism in your mind. Um, but I just point out to you <laughs> that the King James translators <clears throat> were likewise predestinarians, just like me. Have you read the 39 articles of faith of the Anglican church? Do you, do you know what Puritans believed? Oh, you do, because you detest the Puritans. I'm not sure how you do that and then recognize that Puritans were involved in the translation of the King James version of the Bible. Um, don't know how that works, uh, but evidently in some way in your thinking, God used men who had really, really bad ideas. And in that situation, you'll go ahead and separate that out. But oh, everybody else is accountable for everything in your thinking. As we will see, as you uh, will go after the King James translators, uh, I'm sorry, go after Calvin and the Puritans and everybody else. Um, and you just, you just connect it all together in your mind because it, it, well, it helps you with your position. Now, let me get to the video, if I may. First of all, I don't debate Catholics, and you are a Catholic through and through. Um, there's no doubt about that. And therefore, why is that relevant? Well, Baptists shouldn't be listening to you at all. And Baptist brethren, stay away from James White. I would not give ear to a Catholic. You cannot trust them, not at all. Th now... <clears throat> This, I, I'm going <laughs> to, let me tell you something. This doesn't work. I've already told you one story. I could give you dozens of others of people who have come up to me. We've shaken hands. We started talking. 
And this is what they heard from their pulpits. Don't listen to that man. He, he's, 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 he's bad for you. He's going he's gonna to lead you astray. And then finally somebody goes, well, if what I know is the truth, then I should be able to recognize error when I hear it, right? And so that may be the back of their mind. And then they're watching one thing and over, over on the side on YouTube. <laughs> oh, there's a, there's a James White debate. And look at that, he's, he's debating a Muslim in a mosque. Huh, well that's odd. I thought he was dangerous. What, why, why would he be debating Muslims in a mosque? And then they click on it. And let, let's say it's the 2013 debate with Shabir Ali at the Abu Bakr Siddiq Mosque in Erasmia, South Africa. Standing right in front of the Qibla where the Imam leads the prayers. And I'm going through the great exchange. God made him who knew no sin to be, our, to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I'm telling those Muslims that are sitting on the ground right there in front of me that I'm nobody special that I have no right to stand before a holy God, that I need to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And they've never heard anything like this. And so here's a IFB KJV only Baptist. He's watching this and he's going, this guy's preaching the gospel. He's, he's, he's going places that none of our guys go. And he's telling it to him straight. It has nothing to do with the King James. He's, just, he's talking about the gospel itself. And that's where it starts. And eventually, they get over to watch the debate that I did in 2011 with, with uh, Brother Mormon in, uh, in London. And I start dealing with the King James issue. And by then, they start to realize, I, I, I have to use the same standards. If I'm gonna be truthful, I have to use the same standards in defense of my faith that I use in denying anybody else's. And when I do that, that my whole system falls apart. And that's why they're leaving. And that's why you folks do this. That's why don't listen to him because we don't have any meaningful answers to what he's saying. And that's why we attack him when we think he's not listening and then get upset when he finds out about what we said and he calls us out. And then we do what was just down in Florida and the same thing you've been talking about doing. Well, I need to, pre I need to, I need to pray to get peace about this. <laughs> and I, I don't debate Catholics. Do you really think that anybody who's already starting to wonder about these things is going to buy that? Is going to buy Oh, I won't debate him because he's a Catholic. No, you won't debate me because you don't have the answers and you don't want to do cross-examination. You don't want to go through that. I understand that. I, I get it. Okay. So, uh, as to the video, he says in one place, okay, so he, he brings up a clip of my speaking. He says, you're a hundred years behind. The situation has changed since Bergon, uh, which I disagree with in one sense. In another sense, I, I get that. Um, right now, the situation has changed. Sinaiticus now has a huge question mark over it. This is a great book right here. Um, and this book, although I don't agree 100% with Sorensen on it, um, he does a great job showing that uh, some of the recent research, and I've looked at Pinto's videos, and I've heard the Pinto uh, debate with White, um, but nonetheless, I think that book really, in a very proper way, puts at least, the very least, a huge question mark as to the antiquity of Sinaiticus. Uh, okay, now, uh, go listen to the debate. It, you really have to be already completely sold out to one side, um, to believe the convicted forger uh, story uh, and to think that this man could have produced uh, Sinaiticus and that he could have predicted. 
And this is what these guys don't understand. This is why, maybe I can help them out here. This is why I said things have changed. Maybe you just didn't understand it because he's so sold out to the idea that it's two manuscripts versus all the rest. That's just a lie. No one who does textual criticism today, no one who is actually examining variants, writing the field, anybody writing the field would listen to him going, what is, what, what, what's he talking about? What? I don't get it. Because what has changed is the manuscript evidence. We now have the papyri. And Bergon, being the scholar that he was, would have recognized the significance of the fact that many of the key readings that set the earlier manuscripts apart, both Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, are found in the papyri, which are 200 years earlier. We didn't have them until the 1930s. Bergon didn't have those things. So when you appeal to Bergon, that's why I mean when I say you're a hundred years out of date and your entire presentation, I listened to all of it, does not even start to recognize or to understand the importance of the fact that these papyri have readings in them that map directly into those earlier unsealed texts. And so that's why the, the, the Simonides thing is just absurd because the papyri didn't, were not known yet. So he could not have inserted readings. He was, he had no way of knowing into a forged text. That's why it's just, it's, it's just tin foil hat conspiracy lunacy. It's, that's the best level that you can give it. You can write all the books you want about it. You're going to sell them to your fellow King James only us and, and the rest of the world goes, wow, okay, all right. Uh, the re well, the sad thing is the rest of the world goes, wow, and those are Christians. Mm, mm, that's, that's the hard part. Um, so that's, that's, what you've, that's what you don't seem to understand and you're not, not willing to hear. That's what I was referring to. If you wanna stay 100 years behind and keep arguing stuff that no one's even presenting anymore, I can't stop you and your audiences may go, ooh, he sounds really smart, but anybody who knows the field realizes you're tilting at windmills. You're not being honest. You're not dealing with what's going on right now. I'd be willing to bet that you haven't even looked into CBGM. Probably don't even know what it is. And that just puts you, you know, 110 years behind now or something along those lines. Uh, anyway, okay. Um, in addition, because of high tech, um, and I'm not a tech guy, but because of all the technology we have today, Vaticanus can be viewed. And um, Vaticanus is a purely Catholic manuscript. Uh, it's sole possession of the Roman Catholic murderous uh, institution. Okay, what is a Roman Catholic manuscript? Does that mean that Vaticanus bows and the Pope goes by? Uh, does that mean Vaticanus goes to mass? Uh, what is a purely Roman Catholic manuscript? What is, that is pure absurdity. There are all sorts of documents in the possession of the Roman Catholic Church. So what? They've been collecting stuff for a long time. D does that make Sinaiticus a thoroughly British manuscript? <laughs> I mean, it's just... No one could take this seriously. There's, there's not a scintilla of serious thought or scholarship behind any of this stuff. It's just, it's comical. It's sad. It, it, it's, it's just unworthy of you, sir. You, you, just, you just need to... <sighs> so, a Roman Catholic manuscript. Vaticanus can be viewed digitally. Yes, it can. It's online. Um, the, Roman, the Roman Catholic Church. Let me, let me give you an example. In uh, 1993 in the same time period debate that I do with Jerry Maddox, seven hours on the papacy. Man, what, what a plant I am that we, <laughs> that while the Pope's visiting Denver, we're demonstrating that the papacy is false. Um, uh, I saw manuscript P72. It's part of the papal treasures exhibit. So does that make it a Roman Catholic manuscript? I suppose so from the standard you're using. Here's one of the biggest, this is, this is one of the biggest problems I have with all these guys, in, including people like Dave Hunt. 
You guys give away the store. You turn the primitive church in the Roman Catholic Church, and that is not only historically absurd, but it is, ha- you, want it, you want to talk about plants? What would, you, what would you say about people that are in Baptist churches that are teaching Baptists that the primitive church was actually Rome? That's Rome's claim. Remember when John Paul II died? Uh, for days on Fox News, there was a parade of Roman Catholic apologists, many of whom I had debated, who got to do their stuff for John Paul II. And you know what all of them were saying? The church of 2,000 years. That is central to Rome's claims of authority. And you grant it to them. And you're wrong. Nobody back then would have any idea what a Roman Catholic church was. That's that's an oxymoron. It's a contradictory phrase. That wasn't the Roman church. There was a Roman church, but it wasn't the Roman Catholic church by any stretch of the imagination. And so when P72 was written around 175 to 200, there was no Roman Catholic Church. So how could it be a Roman Catholic document? There was no Roman Catholic Church when Vaticanus was written. How can it be a Roman Catholic manuscript? This is simple absurdity. It's childish. And yet you grant it to people. Stop it. Stand back and listen to yourself and realize, oh, Man, I didn't even think. How come you're not the plant? How come you're not the one that is making Baptist, Protestant beliefs look so silly? I've met many a former IFB who's not a Roman Catholic. How come you're not the plant? Because see, I just demonstrated that your argument is so bogus that it makes your entire position look absurd and grants credibility to the Roman Catholic claim of authority. Why aren't you the plant? In fact, isn't this interesting? You won't debate Catholics. Wonder why? Could it be because you are one? See how easy this is? Pretty simple, isn't it? What about Erasmus? Well, I know he was a Roman Catholic. Yeah, he hates. hates t- yeah, the, it should be. It should be. The TR is Roman Catholic. The, Rich is right. You're, we've got you. You've been exposed. We didn't see this coming, but we have found clear evidence that Ted Alexander is a plant, a Roman Catholic plant. Uh, in, uh, in. Now, I hope you all recognize we're, we're being facetious here, but only slightly facetious because we're just using the same form of argumentation that he has wedded himself to. And it ends up turning him into a Roman Catholic.